Hello, everyone. Welcome again to uh, HIPAA lectures and workshop. Salam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ahla wa sahla fikum marra tani fi al-muhadarat wa al-wirash illi HIPAA bitnazimha. Wa shukran jazeelan al hudur Thank you for coming. Uh, today we have very special lecture, and I think after this lecture you can make a little bit money, yeah? Yeah? Are you making enough money? <laughs> Good. Okay, we have today a part of the commercial photography. It is product uh, photography, and this will open, I think this will open a very good opportunity for a lot of people to start very good business, if you wish to. اليوم حيكون معانا ورشة أو محاضرة مميزة وهي جزء من التصوير التجاري هي تصوير المنتجات وأظن حيكون عندكم فرصة جميلة جدا إنه الواحد يبتدي بزنس تبعه أو يبتدي يعمل شوية فلوس من الانفستمنت اللي إحنا بنعمله بنشتري كاميرات وعدسات وأشياء فممكن الواحد يعمل شوية بزنس أنا حترك المايك لجي ألونزو المحاضر تاعنا اليوم والبروفيشنال في تصوير المنتجات يعرف عن نفسه وحاب أنه أنا أقول لكم إشيين أول إشي أنه بليز بعد المحاضرة ما تنسوا تاخدوا الشهادات تبعتكم شهادات المشاركة من على الريسبشن وتاني إشي حيكون في مسابقة حنبعث لكم إن شاء الله إيميلات وكل محاضرة معنا هون حينبعث إيميل لكل واحد حضر هاي المحاضرة بالذات إنه أنتوا تبعتوا صور الصور هاي حتدخل في مسابقة والفائز حيفوز برحلة مع نيكون يا برودكت فوتوغرافي يا ladies and gentlemen I would like to announce two things first thing don't forget please to take your participation certificate after the lecture from the reception the second thing and the happy thing that you will be invited, only the people here, exclusively for the people here, you will be invited to submit uh, photos uh, from product photography of what you learned today. And you will be entitled to enter a competition and the winner will be uh, awarded with a Nikon trip. Yeah, that's wow. I hope I can participate. Okay, here is Jay Alonso. Assalamu <laughs> alaikum Magandang gabi That's how we say it in Filipino I'm a commercial photographer And uh, I just transferred here Five years ago, that's uh, 2012 And uh, my line Has always been commercial photography Now, what do we mean By commercial photography? If you uh, tell somebody Hey, I'm a commercial photographer You'll just get because nobody knows really what commercial photography is all about. But basically, this is taking pictures of things that you buy. And that's where the money is. Of course, you've been spending a lot on your equipment. And you're getting a lot of complaints from your spouses. So you need something to show back that, hey, buying this piece of glass is worth it. Especially if it's Nikon, right? Okay, all right. <laughs> now, you've been following me for many years now, so Mr. Tamimi. Okay, okay. Now, I've been doing this for the past 20 years, and I started out as an editor editorial photographer, and that means taking photos of, uh, for uh, fashion spreads for magazines, and eventually spreading into celebrity photography back in the Philippines, and doing travel photography for Philippine Airlines, and then coming back here, or going here, transferring here, I decided to focus on product and food photography, because I believe this country will really need great photographers, and the potential is here right now. Now, you might be wondering, I cannot do that. Let me tell you a story. In 1993, I hope I'm not giving away my age. In 1993, somebody told me, a friend of mine who's an executive in an advertising agency, why don't you shoot for us? We need more commercial photographers. And I said, no, I don't think I can't do it. I can't do it. Why? Because I'm into landscape. I think many of you are into landscape, right? I was into portrait. 
and it's nice to take pictures of portraits. I was into street photography, and I think a lot of you are doing street photography, right? But you don't earn much from it. Besides, it's more of art. And commercial photography is more of an exacting process. You have to be, you have technical prowess, and at the same time, creative vision. You need these two. So I said, no, I can't do it. Now, I regret that. Why? Because I should have started earlier. I didn't realize that eventually, through my experience with magazines, with other clients, I'll be forced to learn how to shoot spaghetti, how to shoot bottles, how to shoot jewelry, and sometimes how to shoot dogs. So these things, eventually I saw a pattern on what do I need to, not only to excel, but at least, at least for beginners like you to survive. Because there are plenty of photographers right there out now churning out pictures and they have clients already. How can you beat them? How can you be better than them? Well, you cannot be better than them because experience takes time. But you can have this weapon of knowledge that I'm going to share tonight and integrate that with your own vision so you can create images that your clients will definitely would love to eat. Photos that they would love to lick, photos that they would love to eat that will make them hungry or make them want to buy it. Think about the things that you buy. Do you think iPhone is the best phone? Is that a controversial question? Half of the people here probably with Samsung, half of the people are with iPhone. But if you just basically compare the two, there's not much earth chattering difference. But you buy that iPhone, you buy that Samsung, because it tells something about you your lifestyle, about how you want to project yourself. Why would you want a Mont Blanc fountain pen when an ordinary pen can do? Why? Because it's a statement. People buy Rolex not because it's a better watch, because it tells something, right? And companies need photos that will project this kind of mood, this kind of prestige. Nobody will buy a product just because it's the cheapest, just because it's the best. We know that even the best, supposedly, is not selling well. The most popular one is not necessarily the best as well. But we make it happen, product photographers, commercial photographers. And that's the reason why I'm here tonight, to impart something that will help you jumpstart your path towards commercial photography. Maybe it's your second career when you go back home or when you retire. Or maybe you really love photography, and this is a good way to start. Now, how many here are into wedding photography? Not much. Well, I'm surprised, because usually there are plenty. How many are into portraiture? Okay. How many are into events? And how many are into product for professionally? Only quite a few. But there's a high concentration here tonight. That's very good. But if you analyze the market, there are more wedding, portrait, event photographers than product photographers. Qualified product photographers. That means they, don't, they know not only how to operate the camera, but they know how to present the product, and they know how to light the product. And that one is very, very much important. Now, today, or tonight rather, I'll show you some tools also on what I use. And I know equipment is already expensive. That's why I'm going to suggest a few things that are also for the budget conch or for the uh, site. Now, as a product photographer, that means one day you're photographing a bag 
and the following day, you're photographing a car. Okay? And even to a breeder, a camel can be a product, right? But we're not going to discuss how to pro photograph a camel today. Instead, what we're going to focus on is photographing products that you can put on a table. That means consumer items. So what are these consumer items? Cell phones, watches, <clears throat> pen, perfumes, drinks. Yes, so many. See? And if you're a family yourself, you have your own business, you don't have to hire an expensive commercial photographer to do it. If you do selling online by eBay or Souk, you can present your own product. Now check, how many of you here are buying online regularly? A lot. And that number will increase. And because we don't have physical interaction anymore with the product, there is a risk in buying things, correct? So guess what? Where will you, which seller are you going to select? The one with the nicest photos, usually, correct? And that's an edge not only for your client, but you yourself, if you have your own business selling online. Now, because we are focusing tonight on tabletop product photography, what is the first thing that we need aside from the camera? What? Lighting, tripod, a physical object. Lens. Aside from the product, of course. Environment. Actually, you can shoot outside natural light, so you don't have to have a studio light. Filter. Diffuse, diffuser. Well, yeah. But if you know, if you understand the language of light, you, may do, you, don't, have to, you don't have to have a diffuser. You just have to wait for the right time. The one that really saves my back is a table. <laughs> okay? Of course, you can always shoot on the floor, but that will be very inefficient. I'm just trying to be practical here, okay? Now, I always believe photography is half technical, half common sense. And you should be solving your own problems as you encounter them. Why? Because shooting on a table will not only make you become efficient, saves your back, but it allows you to position the camera so that when you shoot a product, it goes eye level. Why is it important to be eye level? Because one common mistake that I always see is this. When you shoot a product, they put it on the table, and then they shoot down. That makes the product small. That symbolizes weakness. That doesn't show the brand. It has to be eye level. Why? Because anyone here working for a Bacala, Lulu, Giant, the most precious real estate space in a supermarket is the shelf at eye level. If you are a merchandiser, you will try to make sure that your product will be on that shelf. Because when you go down the aisle, you don't do this. You don't do that. You do that first. And hopefully that brand catches your attention immediately. Now, if you can't find your regular brand, that's when you look up and look down. That's why catching the attention is of paramount importance. That's why we shoot at eye level. But there are things that are also photographed looking down, especially if you're trying to come up with a theme. And sometimes, sometimes, we are forced to wake up at 4 in the morning just to bring the product somewhere in Hamim because that's how the client wants it. 
We only have one hour window of time to get the right light. As a matter of fact, I prefer shooting indoors studio lighting because it gives me an unlimited amount of time to control my lighting. But they want something organic. So we have to go and uh, I pack my fishing gear. So one hour of shooting, three hours was fishing. <laughs> Unfortunately, I didn't catch any. Okay. So, but most of the time though, when we take pictures, we want it like this. They want it like this. Simple. Why? White. Because the simpler the background, the product will stand out more. Plus the technology these days, they usually cut the product as a whole and transfer it into another layout or design. So that gives them the flexibility. Therefore, you need a product table. Now, usually we talk about small items. So one example would be this. You see this little cove here? Okay. Yes. Notice the curve there. So this is my studio, MS20 Psych. I'm not selling it. I'm just telling you what I'm using. So for small items and anywhere, I carry this. So it allows me to take product shots anywhere. And I can make an immediate, simple background. Now, on the other hand, if you don't have this, by the way, you can get this from Amazon for only around, I think, now 70 US dollars. So not bad, no? Now, another alternative is to get a piece of paper, a, ro a broad one. What's important is to put a curve there because you don't want a line passing behind the product that's distracting. Now, you can always argue, yes, we can always cut the product, but the lesser these things that we have to do, the better for the client or for your production in-house as well. But on location, I prefer to bring this. Why? Because if you're charging this much, 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 500 dirhams per shot, and then you're bringing in a paper, somehow this one gives you more prestige, right? So it's more of, take note, we're into business also. So you guys should also be more presentable, not only in terms of how you dress up, but the things that you should. Why? Because we are a service business. Now, consider this. When you enter a restaurant, it's your first time. How do you assess if you enjoy the food? By looking at the facilities, correct? You look at the place. Wow, will the food be good here? You judge it based on the things that you see. And that's how people generally assess you as a supplier, as a photography provider, if they see that you have competent equipment. Even if you can shoot products with a point and shoot or an iPhone, which you will do, why not? But present them a big camera and tell them, okay, I also use this. It's all about presentation. But what we use in the studio is the shooting table. So this shooting table, actually, uh, we have one here at HIPAA. So if uh, Ronald is, if you're kind to Ronald, he might show you. <laughs> Sorry, Ronald. <laughs> OK. OK. This is not handmade. You can basically buy this, right? And uh, you can buy this online uh, several. I think I have a friend here. Where's, where's Kate? OK. Uh, your studio sells this, right? Yes. So if you contact him, this is only what? 50 dirhams, right? Okay. So you contact him, tell them it's 50 dirhams. All right. Okay. So what is this? This is a product table, and it's made of acrylic plastic. So if you have access to an advertising uh, signage maker, you can basically buy the acrylic plastic instead. Right? And just form the table using a wood and then just buy clamps. If you're going to buy acrylic plastic, I would recommend white 
and black because the, these two are the most commonly used ones. There are other colors for the acrylic, but this is the most used one, white and sometimes black. Now, the nice thing about acrylic is this. You can illuminate it, not only from the front, but also from the back. And in so doing, you end up with a clean outline of your product. Now, this will be easier for the graphic artist to cut out and put it on a different layout. Even for catalogs, they usually have it on a white surface. Now, if you don't have that, for the meantime, you can get a table like this. And if you don't have to show the rear vertical background, then you can just shoot downwards. But if you need to show the vertical background, that's when you need to put a white paper. Okay, another thing that most people at the beginning photographer for products <laughs> fail to do is they fail to demonstrate the product. Yes, probably you understand the product, but others probably they don't, especially if it's a specialty product. One time, I was in a meeting for a uh, safety uh, supplier provider. And they showed me, I want you to photograph this thing. It's just small. It looked like a shaving razor. So I was already thinking, how does Gillette present their razor? Only to realize later on that it's not the edge of what should be the razor that's important, but the end points. Because that is a special hammer which you will use to crack car windows in case of emergency. So that means I need to emphasize that point. Now, many of you here now buy things from Souk or eBay or Amazon. Now, sometimes, uh, most of the time, for the same item, there are several suppliers. Now, tell me, especially the men, all right? Uh, the women don't answer this, okay? Because you, you will know this once I show it. But the men, chances are you don't know this much or you're not probably familiar. If you're going to buy an item for your wife, which of the two will you select? From supplier A? Do you know what this is, guys? Brush, yeah. But what are the contents? You don't know. Well, so would you, buy, would you buy from this supplier or would you buy from this supplier? The second one. Why? Because it's more clear. It tells you what you can get or what you will get when you buy this item. No more, no less. Here's another. Can you guess what this is? Socks. Very good. Wrong. So we need to demonstrate sometimes. So I'm sure plenty of you tonight will be experimenting with your socks, <laughs> doing your portfolio. OK. So don't just show them the package. Probably spread it out so they will know what they will get. Or present it in a way that that's how it will be carried. So that metal C ring there, that's what you, the women put on their arms to carry this purse or bag. So you need to know what the product is all about. Understand its strengths, what is the right front, what is the right back, and so on. And what are the things that need to be presented? Well, based from experience, sometimes, even though we have this extensive experience already of taking pictures of jewelry, sometimes we still make a mistake that we photograph it upside down because of the unique design. That's why you need to talk with your client, all right, what's the best side here? Another thing is this. You have to find the perfect one. What do we mean by this? It's so easy to just go to the bakala 
and get that item. All right, uh, no need to ship me the item. I can get your products from the Bacala. That's true, but here's one example. If you don't select the most perfect item, a lipstick. This is unretouched straight from my camera, right? From afar, it looks fine. But when you look up close, it's not smooth. Some of them are even deformed. So we need to do a lot of post-processing here. Here's another. It looks fine. However, that's because you're looking at a real life item. But that real life item becomes enlarged in the screen of your computer or in a poster. Look, look at that cap. These are defects in manufacture that sometimes escapes the quality aspect or stage of the manufacturing process. Not only that, the box. So you will have to do a lot of retouching here. Now, that means the more time you retouch, the less time you shoot. And clients cannot accept the idea that they have to spend money on you retouching. As a matter of fact, in our experience, we spend two-thirds of the time retouching than shooting. That's why if you can find the best item, that's the one that you should photograph so that you can shorten the post-production time and you can shoot more and that's where the money comes in. So normally, we ask for several copies of the same or pieces of the same item. One time, I especially small items like chips, that need to be photographed up close. Well, all chips look the same, they look yummy, they taste great, but when you photograph them up close, that's when the flaws come out. So, probably I offended my client one time, so I said, no, the pellets, that's how they call the chips. The pellets in your potato chips are not good. I need really the best ones straight from the factory, hand-picked. So one day, I open my door, and I have three big boxes, all of the same pellets. <laughs> all right? That was overkill, but at least I was able to get the best ones and no need to retouch. That saved a lot of time also. <laughs> it, uh, that is if you use your hands, probably no. <laughs> I will just select the best ones, uh, the, uh, let's call this discarded ones, and make sure it's clean. By the way, just one tip. If you are ever trying to apprentice with a food photographer or product photographer photographing food items like that, do not eat what the photographer doesn't eat. Okay, I'll tell you more about that later. Okay, now, as a product photographer, aside from the camera, my best friend is this tripod. Now, a lot of you, I notice, you don't spend much on a good tripod. Why? Because most beginners think this is just an accessory. Well, for me, this is an extension of your camera. Bad tripod, inefficient workflow. Now, you see this tripod here? It's a Manfrotto. Okay? If you have a teenager, son or daughter, same age. This is 18 years old. Yes. So I don't have to spend another money or another set of hundreds of dirhams just to get one or thousand dirhams just to get one. You know, when I got this set, it only cost me around uh, 400 dirhams. Now, if you buy this brand new, that complete set, it will cost you 1,500 dirhams. Right? And when you buy a tripod, I would recommend this, the 405 or the 410. If you notice, it's not the lock and handle type, it's a gear. So what does that do? If I need 
very, very minute adjustment. I can just simply twist the knob. Not much movement. And especially, it's very stable. It won't give me any uh, soft focus. This really helps a lot, especially if you're just shooting with natural light. But another reason why I love to use tripods in the studio, even though we use studio lights, is this. For the setup, sometimes you just need very little adjustment on the product or maybe on the lighting. On the second half of my talk tonight, I'm going to give you a demo on how to shoot products. So from setup to the uh, uh, software that I use up to the lighting. Okay? And you will notice how important that minute adjustment is. That's why I bought an extra head of 410 just in case they discontinue that in the market. Now, of course, you have your tripod, you need your camera. And what's the best camera? Yes. <laughs> I'm not going to talk about this debate again because, <laughs> all right, but Probably some of you are thinking, do I invest now on a full frame or do I still keep my crop frame? Now, truth is, if you're just printing your picture small, especially like smaller than A4, then you can live with a crop frame. But sometimes, as a commercial photographer, you'll never know how your images might be used. It could be printed as a big mural. Or maybe it will be used in Dubai Mall just to cover one wall. It's not about resolution only. It's also about the size of the sensor. So if you have the budget, I would recommend go for a full frame. Not only because it will be bigger, it will be cleaner, but it will have better dynamic range than crop sensors. Now, as far as the resolution is concerned, how many megapixels do you need? Well. This, again, is another debate, but do you know how many megapixels your camera has? 20, 24 on the average, the minimum is 16, correct? All right, for the Fuji users, the minimum is 16, and then the average, we have 24, 36, and we have that extra 50, and there are even 80 megapixels now. But if you look at the photos, how they're used, when you enter your building tonight and you see that flyers of KFC, right, Hardy's or Wendy's on the door, how big are the pictures of the burgers and the chicken? Very small. You don't need 36 megapixels for that. How many of you still print pictures? Very good. Not at the uh, desktop printer, right? You go to here, right? Okay, but the rest, you don't print anymore, correct? We've lost the art of printing. Before, after vacation, the first thing that we do is to drop by the film lab to have our roles processed. Now. The first thing that we do before we eat, we take a picture and post it in social media. Nobody prints anymore. Fortunately, commercial photography still requires printing. But if you're going to go to the mini lab and have your photos printed, the smallest is the 4 by 6 inch postcard size or 4R. How many megapixels do you think you will need for this size? Should we smoke? 800 by 640? You will only need 2 megapixels. 2 megapixels. Here is the trick. Open your camera's resolution, image size. You will see there the pixel dimension. Okay? 
So let's say you have six or let's say 3,000 pixels in one, on one side length or width. Divide that by 300, what do you get? That's the 10 inches. On one side, you'll be able to print optimal 10 inches. And you can even print bigger if you use a software to interpolate it, three, size it up. What about five, uh, eight by 10, your popular eight by 10? You only need eight megapixels. And 11R, that's 11 by 14 or half a newspaper, you will only need 13 megapixels. That means your camera right now, if you bought it not longer than two years ago, that would be more than enough. More than enough to print at any size. And better if it's full frame. Now, next question, and this is the more important one as far as equipment is concerned. What lens? Because this, yes. 50? 85? All right. I'm not surprised that the 50 mm is here. It's brought up because I think everybody here almost has a 50 mm. I'm the only one who doesn't have one. And I'll tell you my reason. Okay. Let's discuss first the mechanics of this lens. Normally, we love to shoot at 50 because it has 1.8. And one of the common lenses is that, for example, 24 to 70. Right. But in product photography, we use this. Telephoto. Now, there's a reason why. Exactly. To control the perspective better. This was taken at 105. Full frame. This was taken at 70. So the long end of your favorite 24 to 70. And this is your favorite 50. And this is the short end of your Got to have lens 24 to 70, 24 millimeter. Look at those vertical lines. You will have to correct that in Photoshop to make it straight. Now, if you're just doing two, three products, that's perfect. But if you're shooting 50 items a day, and then you have to do this every now and then, plus the retouching on the uh, bad parts of the package. Now, that would lead you for a one-day shoot equivalent to two days of post-production. Two days that you cannot legitimately charge unless you explain well to the client that it needs to be retouched. So, this is the comparison between the long focal and the short focal. Less distortion. That's why in my bag, it's more about telephoto. I have wide, but I use that for my personal work like landscapes and street photography or travel. But for work, I always go for my telephoto. Yes, this is the 105, the other one, short focal, that's the 24. 105. Are you going to buy now? <laughs> All right. All right. But sometimes, sometimes a bit of distortion is welcome. Depends on the mood or the positioning strategy of the client. And by the way, let me inject this bit of tip. If you are not graduate of a business school, I encourage you to read on marketing. So you will be able to understand how your clients use the product, the product photos. You cannot be overly artistic in this case. You cannot apply what you've been using for fashion photography for product because this is a different game set. The star here is the product, not your artistry. At the same time, it's ironic. You have to produce technically superb pictures in a creative way possible. Now, that means, ah, I'm going home tonight with a video of Mr. J's lecture, and I'm going to tell my wife, 
Honey, I have a reason now to buy this. Okay. I'm going to tell your wife, no. Okay. Let's go for something different because I take also portraits. Why not this? Yes, I have that. I use that for my portrait. But I don't use that for products. The simple reason, minimum focusing distance. You cannot go closer than 12 inches with these lenses. You will need three feet of clearance or two feet for 85. And the closer you go, no matter what you do, you will never be able to focus the lens. What you need is a lens that can go close and focus especially when you're photographing small items like jewelry and that means you need macro lens of course you can always buy a macro filter or diopter but it won't be as good especially at the edges now this is one of the lenses that i use a 105 millimeter macro now let's go to something that's very also uh, that's very very sought after by beginners and that is the lens speed i got to have that 2.8 for a zoom especially i got to have that 1.8 before a 50 or an 85 but we don't use 2.8 1.4 in product photography we are more concerned with these aperture values. Check your lenses. How small can your aperture go? On the average, it's 22. But in some lenses, it can allow you to go 32. In one of my lenses, it allows me to go to 64. What's the effect of the lens aperture? Aside from light, depth of field, depth of field, or zone of focus. How much of the object will still be sharp in the picture? Because remember, you can only focus at one point, but what about the others? Right? So if you focus on the fender, what about the rear fender of the car? It should be in focus as well. Now, one of the primary concerns when we set the camera is what aperture to use. Even if we set up the lights, right, we don't just set the power. We decide first what aperture should be used in the camera. What is our working aperture? And remember the rule, okay? You control the depth of field, not only by focal length, but by the opening. Aside, of course, from the distance. So this is an example, though. So for those who are familiar with depth of field, this will be a refresher. When we say, why depth of field? Let's say you focus your lens at this second object. The first, the third, and the rear object, rearmost, are still relatively or acceptably sharp now the opposite is the narrow depth of field and this is our go-to technique if we're running out of creative ideas right i'll just blur the background and i look perfect already yes why because it emphasizes the subject a shallow depth of field is also used in product photography if we want to point something special about the product, a part or a certain object. But this is not what we do all the time. Because take a look at this example. Is this acceptable? You can't read the entire label. That means there isn't enough 
depth of field here. You need to have more depth of field. Now, compare this with this. This is accept, more acceptable, right? That's why a common problem in product photography is that there isn't enough depth of field. So that means you need to be using small openings. Now, if you're using natural light only, then you will be forced to use a tripod. Why? Because we want, we usually set the ISO at the lowest level. And what's the benefit of having a low ISO? Cleaner images. The offset is you need to use a longer exposure, especially when you're working indoors. And that's why we need a tripod also. So even in group shots, especially in group shots. Now, how do we control depth of field? How do we achieve, for example, a narrow depth of field? Okay. Well, one, you need to have a bigger opening. So I'd just like to remind you when we, we talk about opening or aperture, we refer to the size, not the number. So when we say big opening, that might be 2.8, 1.4, 1.2. So it's the reverse. When we say small opening, that will be the higher numbers, 11, 16, 22, 32. So how do we shrink the depth of field aside from the aperture? Aside from that? Focal length. The longer the focal length, the narrower the depth of field. You see the importance of the lens at work here. So that means shooting 70 and longer. And the third distance, the closer you are, the lesser the depth of field. Now, it's easy now to think how to expand the depth of field. All we need to do is reverse those things. One, use a small opening. Number two, focal length, what should we select? Less or shorter focal length. Like wide angles, 24 millimeter, right? That's why if you notice, when you use ultra-wides, everything is in focus, basically. But here's the problem. We don't use short focal lengths in product photography because of the distortion. So this is one problem. Number two, we need to move back to expand the depth of field. But that will make the object small in the frame. And what will you do? You will crop. But if you crop, that's equivalent to shooting in small JPEG. What if your client needs a big blow up? Your image will have, will be possible, depending on the size, it will lose details, lose sharpness, crispness. It will even be pixelated. So this is another problem. Take a look at this photo. This was taken at F8. Sharpness is only up to here. If we go one stop smaller, did you notice the amount of sharpness expanded? And if we go one stop smaller than 11, look how the zone of focus expands. That's correct. Question is, do you have 32 on your lens? Because most lenses only go on the average 22. So that's how important the lens opening is. Some of you probably have 45 or maybe even 64. But yes, I have 64. However, I, as much as possible, I try not to use the smallest opening because of this problem. So what is diffraction? Okay. 
when you set your lens to the smallest opening. That small aperture or hole will scatter the light wave. The result in the sensor, you have loss of sharpness, loss of clarity, and that will be very visible, especially when you blow up the picture. In short, the photos become soft. It's focused, but it's soft. And it's not ideal for blowing up. So, is there a solution? Stack focus. That's one. Are you familiar with stack focusing? Okay, that means you take several shots with focus at different parts of the subject and then you blend them all together. That's easy if your item is a box. But if you're photographing a bouquet of flowers which doesn't have simple boundaries, that would be difficult. So, should we go just go back to portraiture? There's one more solution. And that's what you call lens movement. So what is this lens movement? Well, have you seen a camera like this? Don't call all this. I still use that. <laughs> okay. This is what you call a technical camera. But the design is the same as the oldest. The one with an exploding flash bulb. The one that is used during the time of Charlie Chaplin. If you're ever in Abu Dhabi, let me know. Give me a ring. And uh, I'll show you my, this camera. Because we use this for extreme depth of field control. So this is a technical camera. And we connect this. Or we attach a digital back to it and it goes straight to the computer. Now this is my actual camera. The problem is, all right, it's expensive, it's hard to learn. But what is the advantage of this type? When you aim your camera, you focus at a certain point. Let's say we focus at the mouth of the bottle. Unfortunately, for some reason, we have used a certain opening and distance, but our depth of field is represented by this blue area. That means, outside the blue area, the bottle is blurred, out of focus. Now, there are three planes to consider when we are setting up our products. One is the subject plane. The other is the film plane or the sensor plane. And the third, the lens plane. Now, the principle here is this. If you want to expand the depth of field, these three lines must all intersect at one point. Do I sound like ge your geometry teacher? Okay, well, that's basically geometry. It has to intersect, all these three lines must intersect at the same point. And this is what we call the shine plug principle. Believe it or not, all cameras started out like this. Now, how do we put all these lines intersect at one point. Well, I can't remember where I put my parking chip. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so, fortunately, view cameras allow you to tilt. 
And once you do that, all the planes intersect at one point and the depth of field expands. But here's the problem. Can your SLR do that? You can, but you cannot put it back later. So another problem, expensive and uh, difficult to use, the view camera. Fortunately, Nikon has an answer, the tilt shift. I can be a good salesman, no? Yeah. <laughs> All right. The comment with tilt shifts is this. It's used for architecture interior, that's true. If you're using, let's say, the 19 millimeter and the 24 millimeter wide angle. But this is a telephoto, 85 millimeter. And being a telephoto, it's ideal for product, not only product, for portraits. You can control the depth of field further with portraits with this. So the one thing that I uh, like about this is the tilt swing function. However, the nice thing is this. It's a telephoto. It has a short minimum focusing distance, a semi-macro, because the uh, reproduction ratio is only 1 is to 2, as compared to the 105 1 is to 1. But it has an opening from 2.8 to 32. How much is this? I think this is around seven to 8,000 dirhams. Now I would say, oh my god. OK. But take note, this is a special lens. You use this not for a hobby, but to bring back money, to invest on it. And take note, it's difficult to find in the second-hand market unless you buy outside. And even outside, when I search eBay, it's difficult to find. It's, there are only one or two or three sellers, and it's even at a relatively high price. Now, take a look at this shot, F22. Look at the depth of field. Compare it to F8. Obviously, the F8 will have a more limited depth of field, correct? Now, if you combine F8, F8 with tilt, look at the difference. And if you compare F8 with tilt compared to the F32, if you notice, the F8 with tilt has an even wider depth of field than the F32. And that's the important thing about lens control. Yes. All right. Will it affect sharpness? Actually, the simple lens that has F32 or even F45 or 64, the sharpness will be more obvious, the effect, the loss of sharpness. Now, is there a loss of sharpness with this? No, compared to shooting at 45 or 64. Why? Because these lenses are not the same as the ones that you use, that they just basically tilt it. These lenses have a bigger image circle. When a lens projects an image on your sensor, most of your lenses basically cover your sensor. That's why those lenses cannot be used for tilt shift. Because the moment you can put a way to tilt it, the other edge will be dark because there's no more image there. These lenses have wider coverage. That's why if you swing or tilt it, it still projects the best part of the image on the sensor. Any other questions? OK. So I think I saw one uh, being sold by uh, Grand Store. I think it's around 708,000 dirhams. I think it's, there's only one here in Dubai. Okay, this one is both compatible with DX and FX. Okay, so, but normally we use it for FX. But there's no reason why you cannot use it with DX, especially the lens anyway is manual focus, by the way. So there's no issue with the focusing here because you have to focus manually. And even the other brands, 
tilt shift also has manual focus. So that's one thing that uh, you need to uh, consider. When uh, you use tilt shift, it's always manual focus. Now anyway, there's, there's a way to know if you focus your lens properly. There's a focus indicator, right? Even in manual focus, it works. That two arrows that face each other, that's one indication when it becomes a dot. That means it's focused. And another is this. Uh, do you know that there is a diopter at the viewfinder of your camera? All right. What you can do is this. Put it on a tripod. All right. Put your camera on a tripod. Attach an autofocus lens. And aim your camera at an object that it can focus on. So you just half press the shutter button to focus. Once it's focused, there is an adjustment in the viewfinder. That little plus minus thing. Adjust it until it becomes clear in your view. That will calibrate to your eye grade. But make sure if you use your right eye, every time you manual focus, it has to be on the right eye. Sorry? I mean, the, the indicator, yes. But uh, sometimes that doesn't work. It's only two arrows like that. But. Yes, but we're talking about manual focus. So you, to calibrate the uh, viewfinder, right, you need to automatically focus first your lens and then set the diopter. Okay, any other questions? Let's have a, yes? Live view. Oh, wait. Uh, let's have first a 10 minute mental break. All right. And then uh, we'll continue with a more technical stuff. That's why I need you to have a break first. Okay. Thank you very much. I'll see you later. You're here again. I'm a photographer. I'm a photographer. Oh, okay. We always do. Even yeah. I. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody has to. Yeah. Enjoying it? <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad to hear that. First moment, I know. Abdul Kader. Abdul. Abdul Abdul. Okay. All right. Abdul. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Really? Okay, all right. Uh, thank the you. address is old, but the web address. Yeah, that's good enough. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Do you have a website? Sorry? What, your website? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so J. Alonso? Yeah, J. Alonso. Ah, sorry, sorry. Yeah. You don't have enough cards? Or <laughs> it's okay, you can keep it. Uh, it's on, no, they have a uh, double. So it's twice as this. So imagine there are two, and they are connected. So for wider. Well, at least more presentable, right? Yeah. <laughs> it, you, can, you have the, uh, you have the, with this presentation, no, I can charge higher. <laughs> Instead of just a paper. But a paper will do. It will work. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. See you later. All right. Oh, why? Oh. Oh. Yeah. No, no, it's okay with this, but uh, no, normally. Uh, normally, bloggers, bloggers, they use ultra wide. Ultra wide. Yeah, because you're using a DS sensor, so that will be, for example, the uh, 10 to 24, and they usually set it uh, between 10. To around uh, 15 like that because it won't be too wide if it's 18 yes. and then they use a uh, Joby gorilla pod an ultra wide lens uh, Nikon only has one 10 to 24 it's around two five to three thousand there Sigma is the equivalent is uh, around Sigma. 
Sigma. Yes, just tell them it's for Nikon. It's designed for crop so sensors. Then we hit the right mm -hmm. Definitely, and we, it's perfect also for landscape. Beautiful. Well, uh, this is basically an all-around lens, so it's in between. But if you want something wider, go for the 11 to, to uh, 10 to 20, 24. But Sigma is 10 to 20 only. Not bad, because you already have 18. Mm, no. Unfortunately, they're all priced similar. Because, yeah. No. But Sigma only for Nikon. And uh, first the Nikon. If I were you, I would go for Nikon first because Sigma has a slight different color cast. You will not notice it if you don't compare it. Okay, especially interiors, architecture. Yes, definitely. <laughs> it's for demonstration. <laughs> Okay. You'd like to be in the background here. So you're working for Jaira? I know, I'm studying. Oh, still studying, right. Oh. College. Oh, okay. Studying computer science in American University of Florida. Oh, I, I like that. I, I like that place. Yeah. I love visiting the uh, Jaira for it. It's perfect, perfect for photos, yeah. especially. And uh, there's also that uh, the on the w there's the dam, mm -hmm. and there is a road off road going to. I forget the name of that place. There's a, an old palace there also. Yeah, there are mm -hmm. monuments to architecture mm -hmm. like yeah. yeah. Muslim architecture. Mm -hmm. Thirty minutes. We are from Philippines. Mm -hmm. Land of Duterte. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, sure, yes. I'll give you. Okay. So you'll be going now? No, not now. Maybe like uh, 8 30. Okay. Not sure. Okay, hopefully I'll get. Okay, all right. Okay, I'll see you later. Okay, take care. Yeah, you can watch it in there. Okay, <laughs> but you can watch it if you have to leave. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. See you later. Huh? Ano ba? Oh, sige. Seven na ba to? Seven. 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 Sige pa. Uh, tapos mo na yung lecture. Okay, yeah. Oh yeah, uh, see my website here, uh, jalonso.com. There is a link there to my workshop. You just click. Hopefully, uh, I'll be able to start a another set of workshops here in Dubai in the coming months because we're based in Abu Dhabi. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Your voice is there, me too.
so if you're printing big, that would be uh, that would be great. But if it's just smaller than this, then you can make do with this. The point is, you can return uh, the return investment. How long would it take you to recover your investment? This All right, so I hope uh, your minds are re refreshed. So the next thing that we're going to discuss for so the second part is what people actually uh, dread a lot, how to light properly. Many <coughs> beginners focus too much too much on the setting. Is this the right aperture? Is this the right shutter? Without even thinking, why am I choosing this number? There is a reason why you choose a particular f-stop or a shutter speed and even an ISO. We are conscious about the white balance, but we fail to consider one important ingredient and that's light. And it's something that you can manipulate even before it enters your lens. Maybe I should bring here the priest of the Lord of the Light if you watch Game of Thrones. Anyone here watching Game of Thrones? Okay, did you watch the last one? Latest one? Yes. I will not tell you what happened, okay? <laughs> All, right. All right. Now, in the studio, well, it's okay to use natural light. It's free. Problem, it depends on the season and the weather. We have to have specific or control about the light, okay? That's why we prefer shooting with studio lights. Now, if you don't have this, and if you think it's cumbersome to use this, then, and you have this already, why not? It's automated. You can use it in TTL. It's possible. The only problem with speed lights is this. There is no modeling lamp. Yes, it has. You let it burst. But the problem is it eats up a lot of battery also. And especially when we're photographing jewelry, we want a light that has a continuous output modeling light, as you can see here later. But it's actually the flash that we use to expose the uh, photograph. But the problem is that you need to have several things, not like with a creative lighting system. You just need an SU-800, and you can control from your camera how strong each light should be. How many lights should you have as a starter kit? Well, you can do product shots with one, but it's best if you have two. And it will be very, very helpful if you have three or four. So at least two pairs, because usually lights now are being sold in pairs, that should be enough. But you can begin with just a single pair. Now, what about the settings, okay? We're going to focus now on the practical side of it first. There are several sources that you can view in YouTube how to uh, operate studio lights. But it's not just about operation. It's about knowing why you need to set this particular light at this intensity, at this distance, and so on. That's what I want to emphasize tonight so that you can also apply it even when you're using natural light. And by the way, in the future, I just started out my YouTube channel. I'll also give some tips on lighting. By the way, if you are a fan of you, uh, if you can't sleep at night and you want to sleep immediately, <laughs> please subscribe at my YouTube channel. Just look for me, Jay Alonso, okay? Okay. Don't bother me if you end up with nightmares, okay? All right. So, how do we get the right color? That's very important. Why? Because I ended up one time trying to convince a client that the color of their banana is the right one. It 
sounds trivial, but for a client, this matter, color, is a part of their branding. So if you don't put the right color, immediately they flare up. You have to have the right color. So one way to have the right color is to put the right balance in your camera. So how do we use it? Simple. All you need to do is select the light source you're using. So if you're using natural light to take product or portrait, get the direct sunlight. I don't like auto because sometimes it overly compensates. Even if you're using raw, I still use the daylight. I want it specific. Or if you're using your studio flash, you can use this one or your speed light. But if I use studio flash units, I set my lights either to daylight white balance or sunny in some cameras. Or if you, if you can change the Kelvin, the color temperature, you set it to guess what number? 5,500, because that's the standard color temperature of flash units. So keep that in mind, 5,500 dirhams. No, just kidding. OK. But sometimes, sometimes, especially if you switch to a new gear, even if you have optimized your color with your workflow, there would be a shift. So to prevent that from happening, Every shot that I make at the start will have this color patch. And I shoot in RAW. So when I go to the white balance, I just click on the eyedropper here. And automatic, it will come up with the right colors. I'll show you a demonstration of that later. So why not invest, for example, in a color checker passport? Okay. So you cannot just go to your art department and please make me a print out of this. It's made of a specific material, and as a matter of fact, it's prescribed that it will be used for a certain time period because exposure to light will also change the color patch of these color patches. So as much as possible, don't expose it to strong sunlight, which is basically UV, not really the intensity. Now, that is one way for me to make sure that in every shot that I make, I will end up with the right colors. Why? Because Sometimes, you don't calibrate your monitors. So I also invest in color, monitor color calibration. So one example is the color monkey. So you can just Google it, what is color monkey? It's around 800 dirhams or something, okay? So we calibrate our monitors every week to make sure that every time we make retouches or manipulations, we are getting the right density, we're getting the right color balance and details also in the shadow and highlights. Now, another that's related to light is how do you set the quality? Now, there are only two. It could either be this or this. Now, which would you prefer? This, you don't like this, especially if it's for portraits. You end up with, yes, bad complexion. So we usually end up using a light like this. And this is what we call soft light. Obviously, the other one is hard light. So how do we define what is a hard light? That's, a, that's a caused by a flash without a diffuser or small light sources. The smaller the light source, the harder the light will be. But how can you identify if that photo was illuminated by a hard light? Tell me about the shadows. How harsh? Violent? Exactly, I like that answer. Sharp shadows, that's why you call it hard light. Because some people say, there are strong shadows. No, not necessarily. The shadows can be weak, not really dark, but the outline, look at the outline. It's sharp, it's hard. Another, look at the transition 
from dark to light. It's almost immediate. And there is that characteristic hot spot. So no matter how thick the makeup of your model is, if it's hard light, there will always be, like my skin right now, okay, it will always be a harsh, I mean, a, what do you call this, hot spot. Now, as opposed to soft light, it, are the shadows gone? Nope, it's still there. As you can see here, it's relatively mid-tone dark, not really bright, but you lost the outline of the shadow. The outline has become soft. And the transition from light to dark is gradual. And the hot spot, it's gone. It's perfect for portraits. Next. So, is the hard light bad? It looks not nice, correct? But sometimes, sometimes, to establish a mood, like the product was illuminated by sunlight, I use hard light. Where was the window? Upper right, camera right. That's how we describe it, how you see it. Upper right, camera right, right? Guess, morning or afternoon? Why do you say it's morning? You can also have that in the afternoon. End of the day, the afternoon. Okay, uh, let's go home now. <laughs> All right. Now, I took this using studio lights only. This is not natural light. This is artificial light. That's why it's important you understand how light behaves. And I'm going back here to teach lighting. You like that? No, oh, I'm not. I won't do that. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. So here, it looks like it was illuminated by sunlight. Why? Because of the combination of hard light and a fill-in soft light. And the reason, we need to bring out the quality and the subtle texture, which is hard to bring out if you're using soft light. That's why it's not all the time hard light is an enemy. It can be your ally. But most of the time, we use soft light, especially if we want to dramatize the lighting of an item. You can make a 20 dirham kettle or pot look expensive by lighting. Question is, all right, I'm new to photography probably, so I don't know much about the camera, let alone lighting. Wrong. I'm going to give you a simple recipe on how to light most products. So that's why if you pay attention, you'll be able to do this or replicate this. So basically, we use soft light in most of the product shots because we don't want strong shadows to obscure certain product details. We want an even lighting because customers and clients really want to know how a product looks without making it appear flat. At the same time, it should appear beautiful by lighting it beautifully. So, how do we produce a hard light into a soft light now? Diffuser. So, what is an effective diffuser? We said small light sources produce hard light, correct? So, the reverse has to be done. You have to make the light big. The bigger it goes, the softer it is. And one way is this. The most ubiquitous item in the studio. When you say you're a studio photographer, they think you have an umbrella on your head. Okay, now, take note, this can also be used in the rain. It saved me once. But, take a look at this shot. Okay, fine, until you see that one. That is your umbrella. That means you need to retouch that. And I told you earlier, the less retouching, the better. Now, we don't use umbrella for that simple reason because it could reflect on products. And if you notice, most items are shiny. Toothpaste tubes. 
perfume bottles, your mobile, it will all reflect your environment. That's why it's easier to photograph people because people are of basically the same form and texture that you can use the same formula lighting every now and then. But products, no. One time you come with this item, the following day you're going to be photographed by this item, the lighting for these two items will be different. Especially if you consider how it should be angled. You got a message here? <laughs> Your wife is asking you to go home. Okay. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> so we don't use umbrellas. So what about Octabox? Mama, I need to buy that Octabox because it's perfect for my portraits. Perfect. Why not? Because it doesn't have the stems of the umbrella. Fine. But shiny items reflect it still. Now, this one is okay because the pot is round. It worked with the pot. But with a flat surface item like a mobile, you will see that octagonal shape being reflected on the surface of the product, which is distracting and not pleasing to look at. That's why the staple in the product photography studio is the softbox. So if you're going to equip your studio with softbox, don't put or don't buy one or two. Buy several of different sizes. Because one time you might need a bigger one or you just might need a smaller one. So in this example, I use a softbox at the top part, but I use an umbrella for the strap. As you can see here, there's a faint line of the umbrella there. This was taken on location. So if you're wondering why did I use an umbrella, I forgot my other softbox that day. So I just put it at the lower part where it's not so visible, but I still have to edit that one. Perfumes. That umbrella or octabox will be definitely visible. But with a softbox, with a neutral edge, right angles only, straight or horizontal, vertical, look. You see that, I call that sexy outline of a light. Okay, you're a product photographer if you think lighting is sexy and beautiful. Look at that. Look at how it wraps on the product. It's not distracting, not like an octobox or an umbrella. It even enhances the length or the shape of the item, making it look more expensive. That's why invest on a softbox of different sizes. You can even use a softbox for your speed lights. Okay, try this experiment at home. Get a sunglasses, photograph it, and let's say you took a picture with an umbrella. Wow. Very professional. You will have to edit the lens of the sunglasses, and not only that, you will have to edit every water droplet. Okay, how long will it take? Might as well do it another time and use a softbox. It will be better. Now, let's put a softbox. Okay, better. Better than the previous one, but not enough. Why? Because the diffusion is not enough. You need it bigger. So how do you make it bigger? Either use a bigger softbox or bring it closer. Sometimes when we shoot with very highly polished surfaces, our clearance from the light is just a matter of inches, believe it or not. That's why if you have a bigger softbox, it's all the more better. And if we bring it closer, it, look, it will look better. So this just for demo, I brought the, the same softbox closer and look at the difference. So just give your umbrella, send it back home to the tropics where they will need it more. Okay, so as I promised, how do you light a product? Every item requires a unique way of lighting it, but in general, you can use a simple recipe, especially for low budget photo shoots, okay? Or for mass production or catalog. I tell you, anyone here working for Lulu? The truth, nobody? Your shots will be better than Lulu. Okay, all right. You need a product table. 
Of course, it doesn't matter if it's a paper. But the simplest approach is to light from the top. Not from the side right or left the way you do with portraits because you're not doing portrait. You're doing an item that requires texture and form to appear. So that means the light must not be frontal but must strike the subject at an angle. Now, this is how it looks like from the top. Just using one light. And all you need to do is buy a foam board. You know what's a foam board, right? It's a white rigid board. Just place there left and right if you just need additional lighting. But if you have an extra light, maybe you can put there also. So this is the basic formula or framework for our lighting. So this is how it will look like. OK, what about the front? It better, it's about the positioning, which I'll show you later. OK, next. If you're photographing an item that has length as its uniqueness, or the point of interest runs vertical, like for example bottles, then don't light it from the top. Light it from the side like what you see here. Okay, look at how the light, I'm sorry it's haram, but look at how the light touches the edge of the bottle. Okay? Here's another. I'm sorry, okay? <laughs> All right. Look at the tube here. If you light it from the top, you'll just be emphasizing the front, the top part, and you won't show much of the label. That's why you need to know how to read your product. Is it, does it have volume? Then light from the top. Does it have length? Then light from the side. Yeah. Which one? Before? This one. Uh, okay, sorry. Oh, yes. Well, this one you really have to, this is one of the things that we still retouch. Okay, but with the proper lighting, you can almost not notice it anymore. Some people, they still put a black reflector here to minimize it. Okay, but most of the time, because it's also transparent to show more of the texture or the form, Sometimes we leave it as it is, otherwise it will look like it was modeled or from a 3D modeling program. So sometimes you need to have some things left out to make it appear more natural. By the way, yes? That's correct. That's why it's also important to have a polarizer in your kit. Because a polarizer will not totally eliminate the reflection of the light, but at least the lesser glare that usually is present in the packaging because there is a laminate on the boxes that spreads out the light, that will be taken care of by the polarizer. But you have to remember, you have to compensate for the lighting or for the exposure here. Because usually we meter externally, so you need to add at least one and a half stop for that one. Same here for the boots, but in this case, we do not want to polarize it because we want to show the glare or the reflection on the texture. So, if you ask volume, which is in general like a bag, where do we light? Top. If it has a length? Side. Very good. What about shiny objects? This is a different ballgame. Okay? And unfortunately, there are many items that are shiny. So. Before I show you the diagram, I want you to remember this. Incidence is equal to reflectance. What does that mean? When a light strikes a 
shiny object at an angle, it will throw us a reflection at the opposite direction at the same angle. That's the incidence <coughs> where the light came from. And then there's the reflectance. So to catch that reflection, your camera must be positioned at that angle. In reality, we don't set up the lights first. We set up the angle of the camera first. So we visualize the angle of the camera. And then based from that angle, that's where we position the light for us to catch the reflection. If you do that, you will be able to catch the light on the object that will add sheen and it will look more expensive. Not only is it applicable on items, but it's also applicable on food. So basically, this is the setup. Are you familiar with this brand? We had several in the studio, so we were shooting it. And then when I learned its value, I said to the client, can you please get it all? <laughs> OK, all right. <clears throat> and the fourth, transparent or translucent object. This is the more challenging ones, but fun. Where do we light it? We try to light the content by having a light come from behind. Sometimes we use the softbox as a background. Sometimes we use a snoot to redirect only the light at that portion. The idea is to light it from behind and for the light not to be visible in the shot, of course. And then you can add <coughs> your reflector left and right. <coughs> so this is the effect. When we had a light pass through the object, <clears throat> so we can show that it is a translucent acrylic bag. And that's also how we light, for example, shades or colas. Now, what we're going to do next, I'm going to show you a demo on how we set it up. Yes. You can also use that, depending on how you present the item. But if you, if, uh, you think it will be useful, why not? That's why using an acrylic is a nice uh, back background compared to a seamless paper or a solid surface like this. Okay, now for this next setup, uh, some of you would probably would like to go closer so you can see how I set up things. Okay. <clears throat> so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to connect my camera to the computer and uh, show you basically how we uh, shoot items. And I'm going to project also what we're capturing here on screen, OK? By the way, you can uh, <coughs> check. You can contact me from my website, jalonso.com, and for my uh, workshop. It's uh, jalonsophotographyworkshop.com. And uh, you're free to send me a message, but please don't send me a message at 2 in the morning, OK? OK. Excuse me? OK, so this is the software that I use to tether my camera for tethered capture. So this is what you call the Capture One. Uh, capture One. And uh, this is version 9. But you can get now the latest Capture One 10. And uh, <clears throat> this is around, if I call it, 200 plus euro, $300, something like that. Uh, no, just the software. <laughs> OK. And uh, you can download the trial version of this, good for 30 days. And then after 30 days, install it on another computer. <laughs> OK. Oh. 
Anyway, <clears throat> but I tell you, it's worth purchasing it. Hmm? Lightroom. Well, I like Lightroom. I have a license for it, but I don't use it much because I like the uh, way that this software brings out every detail or every bit of data in your RAW shots. So if you're talking about shooting in RAW, this is the uh, industry standard. And this brings out a lot of details, especially in the highlights. So if you have burnt out highlights because of a bit of overexposure, it's easier to salvage those highlights from this software. Okay, so uh, can I have one uh, victim? I'm sorry, volunteer. Volunteer. Okay. Right. You know how to dance, right? <laughs> okay. So he will be, what's your name? Tarek. Tarek. Tarek will be our camera operator. Okay. So uh, are you using Nikon Canon? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. So first, if you notice here, when we turn on the lights, on We have a light already. It's tungsten. We can use this for the shoot, but it will need a long, relatively long exposure. Because tungsten lights, even if it's bright to the human eye, it is very weak for the camera. So we only use this to help us position the lights in relation to the subject. Now, this shortens the uh, production time because if you use a speed light without a modeling light, you will have to do a trial and error shot to get the right angle of the light on the subject. In product photography, precision lighting is important. Okay? Now, the nice thing also about using Capture One is this. You can have a live view of the, uh, what you see, so that you can properly position the item. Okay, so we're going to put first our first item, the chips. So we will do a sample shot. So today you are now a product photographer. So, first item, one that has volume. And a good example would be a bag of chips. Now, we will have another item later on. You have those deodorant there. All right. It, it's a, a small representative of a product that has a lens. And then the third one will have a beer. Sorry, a beer, Bavaria, non-alcoholic beer. You distract me. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. Thinking of something else. Okay. All right. So, we will position the item first. In real life, we will find the one with the most perfect uh, I, uh, package. Less uh, crinkles there with the best uh, body. All right. So... We're going to put the uh, bag here. Okay. 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 So now, Tarek, I want you to position the camera now. So make sure it's eye level. All right. So you can see what Tarek is doing. Uh, you would like to see the first in the viewfinder? Yes, okay. sir. Okay. Yes. So that's the live view of it. Okay, maybe you need to go back a bit. Okay. All right. Make sure you have the line. All right. I tape mo na lang para sa. Sana pabilis pa. 
Okay. Now, anyone here who is a stylist? Wants to be a stylist? Okay. Where are you? Wants to be a stylist? Volunteer. You want? Okay. I want you to arrange the chips for us. Come. So we're going to... <coughs> I want, let's say I'm the art director. I want to see the contents of the chips spread around here. Okay? Yes. You can eat it also, but that's one year old. Okay. <laughs> one year old, because a lot of people have touched that for my workshop so far. Eh? Cornflakes box, yes. <laughs> that one is three years old. But still crunchy. Okay. It's your call. Come on. Uh, I want it every, yes. You think that's enough? Okay. So, Tarek, you will have to focus. Where do we focus the lens? Normally, we focus on the brand. Okay? Because that's the one that has to be read clearly. But by using a working opening like 16, everything should be sharp in the shot. Okay? We have more. Don't worry. You need more? Okay. You happy now? Okay. All right. Now, Okay, because we are shooting, you can hold it for a while, just in case you need to refill. If we are shooting using manual stood dash units, that means our exposure setting must be in manual also. Okay, now I have placed here. F16, all right with ISO 100, as you can see on the screen, all right? So the nice thing about this software is that you can also select from here the opening, but what is the shutter speed? The shutter speed is your synchronization speed. Now, how do you know that? Number one, read your camera man while it's there. Number two, if you set your camera even in manual, or even in program, and you flip up the built-in flash, the shutter speed will default to the sync speed. Different camera models have different sync speeds, 250 or 200, depending on the camera. So my sync speed here is 250. But because I'm using studio flash units, I tend to use a one-third slower than the sync speed. That means it could be, for example, 200. Why? Because usually, when you work with studio flash units at the sync speed, there is a slight darkening at one edge of the frame. That's the shutter curtain starting to close. So you have to delay it a bit to have a really even exposure. Okay? So to be safe, if you want, you can also use 160 or 125. Now that's the reason why it has become a myth that if you use a studio flash, use 125. Why? Just use 125. Okay. Next. All right. Uh, we ready? Okay. Okay. There we go. So let's take a uh, test shot. Go. Tarik. You can also do it from there. It's not? It should. Okay. Okay. There we go. So let's see. All right. Uh -huh. Let's put it. Okay. 
Okay. Let's just make it smaller. As you can see here, see? Yes, we need to focus more on the lace brand. Mm -hmm. Okay, we can turn off the live view for now. Okay. But look at the way it was slipped. You can see the texture, the form, and it's the right white balance. Now, let's pretend. Let's pretend we placed the wrong white balance. Okay? So, Tarek, are you okay there? Live view? Okay. You can just, don't use the live view anymore. Just use the viewfinder. The live view is off. You want to work on the live view? Yeah, I need to focus to zoom in to the focus. No, this will not work while it's connected. Yes, use the viewfinder. So what we're going to do, I'm going to change the white balance. I'm going to put the wrong white balance, okay? I'm going to put incandescent. It's focused already, correct? Okay, I'll take a shot. Okay. It's not the right color, correct? Yeah. Yes. So what are we going to do? We're going to include this in the shot. So as much as possible, it's close to the subject, and it's receiving the same amount of light. Okay? Because you can't go it bring too far too close. It will not get the right illumination. So I'm going to take a shot. Okay, because it's the wrong white balance, you still end up with the wrong colors. But the nice thing here is I have this eyedropper tool for the white balance, all right? And I just click on here, and voila, I got the right color already. Okay, now, I'm not going to change the white balance. I'm still going to take a photo. Okay. It will be the same. It will copy the previous setting to the next shot. So that means while I'm taking a picture, I can set my settings now, improve the contrast, for example, the saturation, and I can adjust the clarity. Okay. And I can uh, even just increase a bit, reduce my exposure. So that means I can make adjustments on the fly. So every time I take a shot, it will be copied to the next frame. So what's the point here? After my picture, after the photo session, I don't have to edit anymore. I don't have to undergo my normal workflow with RAW. Because it's done while I'm shooting it. And all I need to do is select the best shot and export it. Simple as that. Okay. All right. Next. This time, by the way, look at the background. It's bright. Okay. Now, what can we do? We can, if you want to darken the background, okay, to add an extra light, it's a matter of positioning the light also. The key here is look where the center of the light is. Okay? And what are the where are the edges of the light falling on the subject? If I move it forward a bit, okay, and just adjust the angle, I will be reducing some of the light reaching the subject and the background. I uh, sorry, the background. So can we now take another shot? Fire that. Okay. Okay. Did you notice there's a slight darkening in the background? Yes. So you can control how much of the light on the background will fall. What's the point here? So that you can introduce another light for the background. And that is the second light, and we'll call this the background light. Okay. 
bakal ngobrol David ya. Oke. Okay. So, take one shot please. So, if you notice there, there is a slight brightening in the background already. We can even increase its power to make it more pronounced. Okay. So you can make it more graduated. Now you can even make the background darker by using a longer paper so that the, lo the farther the item is from the back of the background, the darker it will be and the more visible the background light will be. Now, this is basically how we shoot for ones with volume. It could be a shoe, for example. It can be a bag. But this is the next thing. What if we are photographing lengthy items? Okay. So we're going to remove this one now. And I want you to style the presentation of these three items. Okay. I'm sweating. I think I'll need one of these later. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, I want this like you're going to uh, show this for a catalog. Okay. Labels must be facing towards the camera. Okay. All right. Good luck. Now, we will try first with the same setup, okay? Three of them. Okay, Tarek, it's time to reposition the camera. Okay. So now, we will reposition the camera. And we'll bring it to the original lighting for catalog because we want the background to be uh, evenly lit also. So we want the simple shot only. Now, we will now, you will now see how or if this particular lighting suits this kind of product. Okay, let's go, Tarek. Okay. All right, there we go. Okay, we got a clean illumination, even lighting, but it looks flat. Right? So, it doesn't show much of the texture and the volume of the cylinder. Why? Because the interesting parts are in vertical, not horizontal. It doesn't have volume. So we will do a different lighting. Instead of coming from the top, we will be lighting it from the side. So it's the same thing, except that we are approaching it from a different angle. Okay. Okay, excuse me. By the way, be careful when working with booms. Okay, that's why it's called boom. You don't want something to boom. All right, can you still see? Let me uh, drop it. Okay. Ready, Tarek? Fire as you will. Fire when ready. Okay. As you can see here, there are highlights now as compared to the previous shot that was 
perfectly flat. So all it takes is just a matter of fine-tuning the position of the light to get the best lighting highlights possible. But basically, this is the difference. If you don't light, if you don't put the light at its proper position or angle, it will not it will just illuminate your subject, but it will not make it appear beautiful. Compare this one with this one. Which one looks metallic now? The second one. That's why it's not just a matter of presenting what the item is. It's also presenting what the item is made of. So is it made of subtle textures or harsh or big textures, smooth or rough surface? So that will dictate your lighting approach. Now, another, because it's slightly dark at the camera left, we normally put another light source on the right side. But what I want you to master, what I want you to get tonight is this, the importance of properly using the right position of the main light. Experiment first with one light. And then later on, you can add on additional lighting. So master first one light. Now, next thing. This is a solid object. What if we are photographing, let's say, a transparent or translucent object? So, I have here Bavaria. That's what I was thinking of earlier. Okay. So, we're going to pour it here. But... To make the appearance, it must be cold, all right? We need ice, correct? So you need only a few seconds to create, to take a shot with ice. But what we're going to do is this, because we're setting it up. While we're setting it up, all right? It takes time, and your ice will melt. Some people order fake ice, okay? But if you're in a hurry tomorrow to do your portfolio and there's no time for eBay to deliver it to you, what can you do? You know what this is? Whatever you call it, it's called in Filipino tawas or alum. Get the rock version, not the powdered. Okay? Soak it in water overnight. The outer surface will appear more shiny. And it will look like cracked ice. And that's what we're going to put. That's why I told you earlier, don't eat what the photographer doesn't eat. Okay? Of course. Okay? How can it be tempting if there is ice and there is no frost or water droplets? You go to your parlor and get one bottle. It's not just water. Go to the supermarket and buy glycerin. The ratio is 50-50. All right, 50 glycerin, 50 water. That will make the water hold longer on the surface. So this is what we use to spray on not only the products, but also vegetables and salads. If you're wondering what we use for hot cake or pancake syrup, it will always look yummy when you use motor oil. And in the mayonnaise for, let's say, chicken sandwich, that would be great if it's white glue. Yeah. So don't eat what the photographer doesn't eat. So we're going to position it first. Tarek, ready? OK, by the way. Of course, I'm just being lousy here, but in real life, me and my assistant, Alan, so if you want to ask a few more about lighting, you can ask him, all right? 
So he's very knowledgeable about lighting. He's been with me for how many years? Yeah, nine years. Nine years. Okay, nine years. And he's still single. Okay? <laughs> okay. All right. So, question? Uh, the uh, reflection, the highlight, or the right side? The blue? Okay, what do you want to do there? The middle one, okay. Ah, okay. Unfortunately, this is one problem that it cannot be solved by a single shot. So what we do, we take shots individually and we composite them together. Because it will reflect on the other product. That is one thing. Okay. So, by the way, I was telling you, yes. Whenever we handle shiny surfaces in the studio, we always have gloves. Cotton gloves. Why? Because you may not notice it, especially if your skin is as oily as mine. Okay. I can fry an egg now. It transfers. And when you blow it up, it's very visible. And that's annoying to a client, especially a, for a jewelry. Okay. So this will be our item there. However, we need to light up the background. We need light to pass through here. So there are several options. We can use the softbox for a backlight. We can use the, uh, also the snoot to backlight on this one. So just a demo. We'll show it here. Okay, so taas mo lang. So before we put the light, or before we put the liquid, rather, we will take some test shots first. So how are we doing this during the film days? We use a lot of Polaroids. So you know that instant film? Because we don't have LCDs before, we were using uh, medium format cameras. So these medium format cameras, before we put the film, we have a what you call Polaroid back. So we use instant film first to preview every shot, every stage. And that's quite expensive. So to position the light, we normally turn off the other lights. So we will have an idea how the modeling light will fall on the subject. So maybe we can bring it closer. Okay. Okay. Can we have some of the lights here uh, off first? Yes. Okay. Can you please try? We'll just want to see the modeling light. Okay. Okay. Uh, live view. Are you? Did you stop it already? Okay. All right, Tarek. Okay, Tarek, come here. I'm going to teach you another skill. This one. This is for the live view. Okay. Okay. So just click on that, and that turns your live view. All right. So you can see here. All right. We will now. You can adjust the lighting. So we can make it more even. So this is what makes the most, takes the most out of a product shot setup, the positioning of the lights. Normally, when we take a photo, it will just only be a few seconds. But after that, uh, before that, it takes a lot of time setting up the item. Sometimes, depending on the requirement of the shot, it will take hours. That's why when we charge for, by the way, when we charge for product photography, we don't charge per hour. We charge per setup. Because, for example, if we're going to take a photo of this one and they want a different open, we might have to set up the lights differently again. And that's another setup. So we charge on a per setup basis, not on a per time basis. Per time, that's good for events, for wedding, for example, or just a coverage of an event, but not for product photography. Okay, so maybe we can uh, take a uh, test shot here, Tarek. So this is what we do first with the Polaroid. Now, fortunately, we now have a uh, digital back or a digital camera. 
Oh, by the way, do you see the lines here? These lines can be repositioned to represent one portion of the product so that when you put another product, it will be on the same spot. So that's perfect when it comes to compositing. So these are what you call your guidelines. Okay. Okay, all right, better. We'll go to the uh, other one, this one now. Okay. And we'll take one shot. Okay. You can see there. All right. Now, of course, the lighting is only for the item because that's a, uh, what you call, a see-through or translucent object. Now, we will test for the uh, can itself. Okay. Okay. So, you see there, if you don't like the position of the highlight and so on, you will have to reposition the light until you find the right desired highlight position. That's why it's very, very important to have a live view and a modeling lamp. Because if you keep on doing this with a speed light, what will happen? It will just be an endless trial and error. So one of the hardest things to light is actually shiny surfaces like this one. So some of the light is not reaching the front part. So we can switch to live view, Tarek. Okay, so you can see here the effect of moving the light. Okay, and we can even add another light at the other side to balance it. But I'm not going to emphasize on this much. I want you to see what will happen if we let the light pass through this glass. Okay, so let's pretend that the lighting for the can is already perfect. We already have the lighting for the translucent or see-through item. So the next thing to do now is to add the content. Okay, So we're going to put here now. OK, sorry. Now for, I don't normally fill it. I just check it first halfway because I want to capture the froth there, the bubbles. So before I go to that, that's when I uh, spray. So when I spray, you have tissue lamp. Okay. I go for the finest mist. Okay, nothing. You don't want too strong. You just want a fine mist there. OK. So I'm not going to dwell too much on this. But you will see the difference. Maybe you'd like to take one test shot so we can see that it's very shiny. So it doesn't suggest it's really cold. But with the addition of something like this, OK, it doesn't still look cold, right? OK. Okay, let's add something here. I'll add more. Hmm? Uh, the ratio is 50-50. Yes. You can also use this to uh, spray on your face to make you appear you're always fresh from the... Uh... Yes. Find this from the uh, kitchen supplies supermarket. So, okay, and then we're going to add the froth now. Uh, the uh, 
rest okay all right Tarek it's your call there you go so as you can see here light passes through and you can see the water droplets there now that suggests it's really cold or fresh from the refrigerator so all you need to do is if the froth goes out you can add more and you can also do this trick when you're photographing coffee why because when you photograph coffee normally you have to mix it hot but the problem is that as it cools it becomes a stale black correct so normally a fresh coffee a freshly stirred coffee will have bubbles correct so your best friend is the detergent fairy just put fairy and it will appear freshly stirred just don't drink the coffee and this ladies and gentlemen is how we shoot product photograph product photographs Thank you. This one, this one. Okay, this, here's a good question. What about this one? You can see the edge. Well, I'm just trying to do things quick here, but in a true product table, you see the curve there, and then at the edge, there is another curve so that you won't catch the edge. So this is not the best uh, item no, to use? No, no. Normally, this is too big for this kind of uh, background we normally photograph small items with this one yes the lighting devices have okay a uh, nice question many people have always been wondering what's inside okay well some people report there's a cat inside but actually it's just a bulb a regular bulb okay can I turn it off so we're going to remove this okay and that's how it looks like from the side so there are two bulbs inside okay so tanggalimarenta one is the uh, one the elongated one that's an ordinary tungsten light you can buy that from the hardware and the other one is the more important one the round thing that is the flash tube that's correct so it looks something like this okay uh with this uh, any other questions Point here. Is it acceptable as a professional? Or no, no. no. It's Normally, it's we will spend we will spend hours trying to look for that black spot and put a white reflector on that. Okay. So this thing, the demo that I just showed, this is just a rough way, just to show you to emphasize the importance of putting the right light at the right position. But it might even take 30 minutes just to find that solution. That's right. Yes? Okay. Do I shoot raw or JPEG? Well, if it's for my selfie, I just shoot JPEG. All right. But I always shoot raw, 100%. Why? It maximizes the data that can be captured by your camera, especially if you're using full frame. Take advantage of it. Hi, Sir Jay. Uh, you said you price per setup. Is it? Uh, does the number of light affect or, or one of the factors that you price? Yes, when you set up a product shot, of course you need to know how the client expects it to look. So that will determine how many lights will you use. Plus, do you need to buy certain props? Do you need to buy bricks? Do you need to buy wood? So that will add to the cost. Now, how long will it take for you to build that setup and fine-tune it? 
So the basic ingredients of pricing would be the cost of the materials, okay. right? How long will it take you to set up? For example, one hour, how much do you charge per hour? Of course, this is a difference. I'm not saying, I told you earlier, don't charge per hour. Yes, that's true, because you still need to add the cost. And plus, you need to add your premium. If you have a unique style, and nobody else can do that, you can even add a price for that. Now, why do we charge per setup? Because let's say I'm going to change the angle of this. I'm going to put it like this, or like this. Of course, if you notice by now, the lighting will have to change also. And if you have to change the lighting, you will, that takes time again to set it up. So probably the second setup for the same item might cost me lower. That's why I encourage clients who are on a budget, tell me what you need, what, how you're going to use it in the menu or in the catalog. Because if we just need a uniform lighting and a uniform background, that will save them money, of course. But you still have to charge how many shots you were, uh, you're going to charge it based on the number of shots. Why? Because for every shot that you will submit, take note, you still have to do a cleanup. And that takes time also. Yes? How do you shoot uh, freshly cooked food, like, you know, the, to capture the smoke? How do I shoot freshly cooked food? Or, uh, yeah, or, s or just smoky things. Smoke? Yes. Okay. That's easy. Overcook the food. No, just kidding. <laughs> well, this, uh, you're, talk you're thinking, for example, like a sizzling plate? Okay. First thing you need to check is, is the plate hot enough? So we normally have it hotter than normal. So it has to be in the flame longer than it's supposed to uh, when you cook something. If they can make it hotter than the usually way they serve it, that's better. Second step, I want you to touch it. No, just kidding. Okay. You can feel it when it's hot. So the next question is this. How do you bring out the smoke, all right? Well, we live in an archipelago that has plenty of volcanoes. And there's one thing that we learn. When hot lava is exposed to cold air and water, that's when explosion occurs. So what do I do? I ask them to add droplets of water on the sizzling plate. And that's enough to make your steam, which will look like a smoke. The problem is having it too much. Another is this. I once photographed a, uh, you eat crabs, mud crabs. I love it when it's steamed, right? And it turns really red, bright red. But to make it, oh, I make you hungry. Okay. <laughs> to make it more delicious looking, I wipe the crab with olive oil to make it shiny. Now, there is a steamer. Usually, we use that to steam crabs uh, in this Chinese restaurant that I photographed before. And it has to have steam. So you can use that also for shomai. But what, how do we maintain the, the steam inside? Go to the nearest hospital and borrow their nebulizer. That's what we use to pump the steam out there. So you can buy your uh, homemade uh, you get by to the pharmacy and get a nebulizer and then put the right amount of water there and what else you put there to produce the steam. That is perfect. Well, as much as, no, we don't do that anymore. As much as possible, there is a movement that even with food stylists worldwide, they try to make do with natural ingredients. There's a movement now to to uh, go towards using natural, not much fake. For example, with ice cream, we really do that. But what we do, I'm sure you've heard of the mashed potato, right? But we don't shoot that. We use that as the model to set up the light. Now, once everything is perfect, that's when the actual ice cream comes in because you will need, it only takes 30 seconds. So once it's perfect, the setup, that's when the ice cream comes in, and there you go. Any other question? Sorry? Well, 
if the mayonnaise is stubborn and there's no other choice because for example in a burger you it has to be precision that you put or you inject so we use syringe for example to inject the ketchup the mustard and the nice thing about white glue it already has its own uh, yes that's true and on the bun they cut the excess cut uh, the flakes of the bread where you cut the bread normally when you cut the bread when it comes from the bakery it's not perfect so we they, we trim that to make it appear perfect but there's also a movement now that in product in food photography it's not so much well uh, arranged that uh, sometimes the uh, the ketchup is dripping or the uh, there's just a few fries left next to the burger so uh, well taste change and the trends change any other question like how old I am <laughs> all right okay <laughs> we would like to thank you very much a big hand to thank you very much thank you thank you thank you and I would like to thank all of you ladies and gentlemen to attend but our lectures and workshop I think he made us a little bit uh, hungry yeah <laughs> yeah we should have <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. We would like also to give you a thank you letter and to have a group photo, if you don't mind. <laughs> okay, can you thank come you a little much. bit closer? Stand okay. up and come a little bit closer. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. Ah, okay. I'm gonna die. That's a new cut. One more, one more, one more. Bye. Okay. Okay, everybody, don't forget to take your certificate and stay tuned to get the email uh, from us to submit your photos to be able to enter the competition and to win uh, Nikon Safari. By this time, they should be. Yes, yes, yes. Give me one. Yeah. I passed the other day. <laughs> My mom is always outside. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes, please. Not yet, not yet. Okay. Thank you very much. We will meet again. We will meet again. We will meet again. Looking forward to it. Yes. That's perfect. That will be the, the real world. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much. Thank you I very really much. Are you there in the office or not? You always contact me first. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I don't have the number there. Okay. I contact uh, Alan. Alan. Yeah, and then Just give me no, your no, email. No. Email because I usually answer one. Yes. You have my email in the workshop. I don't know. I don't know. Go, to the, go to the workshop page. Huh? Go to the workshop page. Jalonsoftworkshop.com okay. oh, okay. okay. and okay. photography. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Oi. <laughs>